Yes, I'm. <laughs> Hello, welcome back, everybody. The next talk is about AIMS, and the talker, uh, the speaker is Jonathan Carter. Enjoy. Cool. So my name is Jonathan. Um, I work on a few Debian and Ubuntu derivatives and uh, systems based on those. Um, and today I'm going to tell you about AIMS Desktop. Um, it's one of the paid for derivatives that I'm working on. Um, so before I can tell you about AIMS Desktop, I'll tell you a bit about AIMS itself. It stands for African Institute of Mathematical Sciences. Uh, it's a center of excellence in Africa for, um, for the study of mathematical scientists and it, um, it, houses a, it houses students from all over Africa and promotes um, it, it aims to be the MIT of, of Africa, basically, and tries to advance um, mathematics and sciences in Africa. So, uh, its whole history is very interesting, and I'm going to go a little bit into that as well. And it was founded by Professor Turok. Um, his Wikipedia page doesn't even do him completely justice, as impressive as it is. Um, there's lots of interesting YouTube videos and interviews with him, which I can recommend. Um, he, he comes from an activist background. His family had to fled South Africa in the 1980s because um, they, they were very against the apartheid regime and they had to face arrest and had to fled the country. And during all of this, he continued to study on and, and achieved great academic and uh, scientific accolades. When he came back to South Africa, um, he founded AIMS in 2003. And the story of that is also a bit interesting because um, close to where his parents lived, there was this old hotel that canals uh, 80, which has 80 rooms, and it was falling apart and going down the wayside. And his father said, well, you know, you always want to start an institute for mathematical sciences in Africa. Um, why not, why can't we buy this building? And when they found out what it cost, um, it was prohibitively expensive, and it was a big problem in, in getting it. And Neil's father just started sending faxes to everyone he knows to, asking them, you know, can you support us, can you help us? We want to start this institution. Um, what can you do to help us? So um, the, the, the response was overwhelming, and they raised enough money to buy the building outright and some of the buildings next to it uh, eventually. And uh, they founded this institution that could uh, improve mathematical sciences. Um, yeah. So it's actually quite nice. It's close to the beach, you can't really see it on that picture, I see, but um, it's nice for students and uh, um, people from all over Africa come stay there for a few months to, to do their courses. Um, and there's, and there's also, it's also a cooperation between a bunch of other local universities and in international universities that have founded. Um, since it was originally founded, it expanded to more countries. So um, there's now a center in Tanzania, Cameroon, Ghana, and Senegal. There's also one being founded in uh, um, Rwanda next. It's the next country it's expanding, which should be quite interesting. And the, the whole project of all the AIM centers combined is called the Next Einstein Initiative. Um, and yeah, like I said, um, by 2023, there should be 20 centers in total. That's the goal that they're aiming for. Um, that sense of activism is also still strong in, uh, in the spirit of AIMS. So, um, more than a third of the students are women, which doesn't seem ideal, but it's a lot higher than the single digit numbers that you'd find in other universities um, in mathematical sciences. Um, they also study areas that are relevant in Africa and important, like AIDS and Ebola. Um, and one student in Cape Town this year even did a study on uh, shark detection, um, which was really interesting. But that's a very brief introduction to AIMS. Um, I guess we can move on to the software, which is a bit more interesting, maybe. Um, so, in 2003, they decided to go with Linux from day one. He, um, Jan, the IT manager there, um, made a big case for saying that, you know, we, free software is good and it's the way to go. Um, initially, people weren't convinced, but they started using Python and SageMath, RStudio, GNU Octave, and, and the bunch of other related software, and it worked really well. Um, in 2004, they did move to Ubuntu, which is what a big part of my talk will be about. Um, 
And also, I mentioned one point, the advocacy work remains ongoing. So what that's about is we often have um, visiting lecturers coming in from um, Europe and North America, and often they want to use proprietary software like MATLAB and a, a bunch of others. And then the, the local lecturers there will typically say, you know what, you don't need this proprietary software to teach. We, we can easily adapt this to SageMath or some of the other software that is used. And after they've used it and see that it actually works, they, um, they tend to go back and teach this back home as well. So that's a really positive effect of, of this as well. So I'm um, just going to talk a little bit about some of the um, packaging work that's important. Um, so so um, Ames contributes some of the SageMath build networks for Debian and Ubuntu. And the feedback from the Sage developers was that it, it helped a lot with the release because the smoke test went a lot better before. It was the first time where they didn't have to retest a whole bunch of extra things on release day and do rebuilds. Sage in Debian. Um, the Sage Math, uh, the Debian science team is doing a great job um, of getting it into Debian. It's 75 out of 90. Four of the standard packages are, are up to date and unstable. And there's actually, uh, if you look closely, there's actually just about five or six packages that's still left. And we're not involved at AIMS in this specific effort, but we want to get more involved and get more of the people in the organization, uh, um, Debian maintainers, and get them involved in this effort. Um, and the previous slide I actually missed something. So um, currently, those, that work is Amos maintains the PPA for Ubuntu, and uh, the PPAs are really nice features of of the Launchpad and for Ubuntu. Um, I don't think they could have. It, it makes things a lot easier. So um, why did they switch to Ubuntu in 2004? Well, I think firstly a lot of you might remember back then. Um, Woody was quite old at the time, and Sarge took a long time to release, so it was a bit of a bumpy time for, um, for Debian, and Ubuntu had lots of promise. So if you remember back then, I'm going to go into some detail about what attracted Ames and a lot of people to Ubuntu at the time. So if you remember, Ubuntu, it, the Windows disks had labels on it that says, do not make illegal copies of the disk, uh, when Ubuntu said, legally free to copy, modify, and redistribute. Um, Mo and at the time, another problem with Fedora and Red Hat was they stopped Red Hat Linux in, um, in exchange for, for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And the licenses changed so that the binaries weren't uh, redistributable and you had to get a license just to access it. And Mark Shuttle have talked about this um, and criticized them for that quite strongly as well. And Ubuntu had, back then had this thing called the Ubuntu Promise. I talked also about humanity to others and I am what I am because of what we all are. And uh, Canonical also said that, uh, you know, Canonical will not charge license fees for Ubuntu now at any stage in the future. Um, and this was reiterated in things like the Ubuntu book, like our software should not come with a license fee, that we should be able to share our software, modify it, and share modifications as well. On top of all the, the, the humanity and spirit of sharing, the Ubuntu desktop also became very polished over time, and it was a good reason to stick with Ubuntu. Um, there's also features like the Ubuntu installer as is, is very easy. Um, as he's talked about people that are killed, <laughs> or people that we kill by wasting time choosing a mirror. Partitioning is something that users struggle a lot, and we found that the Ubuntu installer is absolutely great for, um, for many new users, and I think Many of the users that end up installing um, AIMS desktop outside of the AIMS organization um, wouldn't have done it if it wasn't this easy, because you can just drag, this is how much I want for my other operating system, this is how much for AIMS desktop, and um, it, it's, it's dead simple like that. Um, so we also made some changes to the AIMS, AIMS desktop ISO so that we don't pretend to be Ubuntu too much, or that we, don't, we make it clear to users that it's not a completely pure Ubuntu system that they install. So it changed the artwork to reflect it being called AIMS desktop consistently everywhere um, in the installer and in the live ISO and even the EPC issue. We also don't install Airport because we don't want bugs that's in um, AIMS desktop to be automatically sent to Ubuntu and pollute their, uh, um, bug, their crash database. 
So, um, recently there's been lots of discussion about Canonical's IP policies and the problems around that. And I didn't initially pay too much attention to it because I thought it was typical trademark licenses and uh, licensing that just protects a brand and um, that you can't make your another Ubuntu uh, um, product in the same field. But recently we looked in, I looked into it a bit more and um, I'm going to read a bit through the some excerpts of the IP rights policy. Um, so first step is you can download, install, receive updates for Ubuntu for free. Fine, Ubuntu is freely available to all users for personal or in the case of organizations internal use. It is provided for the use without warranty or implied warranties are disclaimed to the fullest extent permitted law. So I thought it was strange that they mentioned for personal or in the case of organizations internal use, but I'll read on anyway. You can modify Ubuntu for personal or internal use. You can make changes to Ubuntu for your own personal use or for your organization's own internal use. So when I was reading this, I thought, well, sure, that's the normal rights you get with any free software. And then the next point says, you can redistribute Ubuntu, but only where there has been no modification to it. So I thought, hmm, that's a bit odd. That doesn't quite fit in with what Ubuntu has been uh, about in the past. Uh, you can redistribute Ubuntu in its unmodified form, compete with the installer images and packages provided by Canonical, um, and that includes virtual machines. And any redistribution of modified versions of Ubuntu must be approved, certified, or provided by Canonical if you're going to associate with trademarks. Um, otherwise, remove and replace all trademarks, and we'll need to recompile the source code to create your own binaries. Canonical's community team also says, additionally to that, that if you want to make any modifications to Ubuntu ISO or system, you have to recompile all the binaries um, um, for that. They use trump clauses in um, the, the, the permissive licenses in Ubuntu to add a, additional restrictions to how you can uh, distribute Ubuntu. Um, so what does this apply to? Um, the disk, CD, installer, and system images together with Ubuntu packages and binary files are in many cases copyright of Canonical. Um, and all of, the, all of those packages are subject to the IP rights policy. I also continue to say that Ubuntu is built by Canonical and the Ubuntu community. We share access rights owned by Canonical with the Ubuntu community for the purpose of discussion, development, and advocacy. We recognize that most of the open source discussion and development areas are for non-commercial purposes, and we therefore allow the use of Canonical IP in this context. So this was a lot to unpack for me at the beginning. I was like... <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's going on, and um, there has been lots of blog posts and discussion about this in the community, and um, I also thought, you know, how is this going to impact AIM? So I, I approached Jan, the IT manager, and told him, you know, um, maybe you should get in touch with Canonical and, and ask about this licensing and what kind of license we'll need, if any. And I would, even if we do get a license to distribute it freely, it's not really ideal because those conditions aren't really exactly what we signed up or wanted when, you know, when we chose Ubuntu, wanted to go with that. Um, because we want our software to be free software and redistributable and all the users should be ac um, able to access it. So Jan got in touch with Canonical's legal team and they basically gave a license, but it actually just added more restrictions than what was already stated in IP policy. So I can't post the exact thing, but Here's a snippet of that as well. Uh, they prohibit commercial uh, distribution, which includes um, distribution of AIMS desktop to anyone other than AIM South Africa, AIM Centers Globally, African universities, whether or not affiliated with AIMS, alumni of AIMS or researchers of AIMS. So basically, if I take an Ubuntu CD, put some free software packages on it, and hand it to you today at DevConf, it would be illegal, and I'd be breaking uh, Ubuntu's redistribution rules, which I think is quite messed up and uh, not quite what, uh, what the Ubuntu promise initially set out to be. So, I... <laughs> um, so, yes, but uh, having said that, canonical people are really nice. I, I don't want to demonize them at all because even here at DebConf, um, two people... Um, from Canonical actually said, you know what, if you, if you create the, 
uh, Elias project for the for the Ubuntu installer, um, they'll help port it to Debian, and they're prepared to help on that. And and I want to encourage Amos to switch to Debian um, if if the Ubuntu licensing situation doesn't improve. But it takes a lot of work because we need that installer to be easy. That little partitioning thing makes a difference between thousands of people installing it on a personal machine or not. It's it sounds silly, but it's that simple. Also, we have to make the desktop really nice and um, consider security updates. Maybe we'll get it, all the packages into Debian eventually and just make it a pure blend. That would be the first prize, um, and it would be really easy to maintain in the future. But we'll need a lot of help on that because I'm not working full-time on that project with them. And they're a small team um, that are quite stretched already. Uh, especially with all the expansion going on, it's difficult to hire enough IT people to uh, keep up with all the demand. Um, so my, one thing I'd like you to consider is if someone can still considers an Ubuntu as a free software or open source, then by what definition do you do that? Because I don't know one that actually um, fits. And then another, um, if anyone here at DevConf is willing to get involved in AIMS Desktop and help us show that there's a community who's interested in supporting it on Debian, um, please email that address and say that you are that you're willing to help because um, one of the concerns that AIMS is, has is that Debian doesn't have as big community as Ubuntu. And I think currently the Debian community is several factors bigger than the Ubuntu community and it would be nice to show this to them or to prove this to them. We've already had two people who said that they're, they're willing to spend another uh, month around DebConf in Cape Town next month and, and come in and help out and work on this. So if, we, if I can show more of that, then maybe we can um, easily twist Ames's arm to, uh, to switch to Debian um, maybe in the next cycle. Um, so yes, that's it. I still have five minutes for questions. Uh, so if there's any questions or comments, uh, feel free to do that now. Um, I didn't really follow what Ubuntu does with its policies or anything, uh, but the way I understood is um, that this is a distinction between trademark and copyright. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, in my opinion, doesn't really make sense is this uh, requirement to, to recompile the binaries, because why? Um, yet I, I think this is a little bit like Firefox and Iceweasel, where they basically just try to protect the name of their product for their own reasons. Um, so uh, how much do they restrict um, the actual copying of, of source as opposed to uh, restricting the use of the name unless you've got a license? Okay. Um, okay, those are a few questions. Let me just repack that. Um, okay, so in terms of copyright versus trademark, um, their IP rights policy isn't just the trademark policy. It's, it contains some copyright as well. So the argument is that on a copyleft licenses like the BSD and MIT licenses, they can impose additional rights on the binaries. So the, the source packages are still completely free, and you can rebuild your, you can rebuild the whole canonical archives and use those packages, and that would be fine. Uh, they can't enforce anything on you on that. But if you want to use the binaries, you have to recompile them if you want to do that in your own system. Um, and it is similar to the Firefox. Um, issue, but I don't think they need to go as far as stop you from distributing the binaries to protect their trademark. I think that's maybe going a step too far. Uh, so I'll leave that there. Um, with respect to that, um, how would enforcing that work when we get in Debian reproducible builds set up so that they get the same binaries as we have? So that enforce that our binaries are not to be used to? Um, yes. <laughs> um, there's, there's also a lot of un unanswered questions. Um, people have been trying to get answered, answers from Canonical for a while now. Um, because I seem very overzealous about removing every instance of Ubuntu everywhere where it gets displayed. But Ubuntu is even present in the version numbers of package versions. and. Um, Within Debian. Yes. <laughs> so I think that's, that's completely unenforceable if they uh, upload packages to Debian of an Ubuntu name in the version. I mean, 
And there's another question. Uh, so, oh. so you mentioned the the uh, the things that was nicer with the with the Ubuntu installer uh, compared to Debian uh, for deployments. Uh, have you have you tried to to get in touch with the like the Debian installer team of, of how easy or how difficult would it be to to adapt some of these things? I mean, if the source code is there, maybe they could we could adapt the functionality instead of of thinking of you picking staying with the Ubuntu. Um, I think in that case, it's more of a UI um, issue. Um, in the text version, I'm, uh, I talked to some, Ubuntu, some Debian installer team members in the Ubuntu team in the past about that, and um, it is a bit difficult, but I think it might be possible. Um, but it seems like it's a shorter route to get Ubiquiti into Debian than to get Debian installer to get those uh, UI element na elements natively. Um, maybe there could be some kind of text version where you can press left and right to just shift between how much percentage you want for your other operating system in Debian. Uh, that would be fantastic, but uh, I'm not sure myself either, but I'll, I think I'll speak to some more Debian installer people and maybe we can find some better answers for that. Uh, of course, that will immediately put us on a battle path with the FSF, right? Because then we're promoting the other operating systems on the computer. But yeah, no, that's right. Sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't get Yeah, we'll be promoting the other operating systems on your computer, yes. which we're not supposed to do, according to the FSF. Um, well, we have to be pragmatic about it. People still want to use some old software on the other systems, but if we can get Debian on more systems, that's what we want, and that's what we'll continue to push. Maybe eventually they'll decide that the old system isn't um, important to them anymore and just get some disk space back. <laughs> Maybe if we can, we, if we only offer the option to shrink the other system, but not expand the other partition, mm. th then we're still <laughs> pushing it. <laughs> yep, indeed. Anything else? Cool, thanks a lot.